All right, so um, yes, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Um, I, this, yes, as, um, I'm going to be talking about identifiability of viscoelastic mechanical systems, and this is joint work with Adam Mahdi and Seth Sullivan. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to be talking about structural identifiability today. So structural identifiability is about finding which unknown parameters of a model can be determined from known input-output data. So we use the word structural here, which basically means we're assuming we have perfect data. In other words, it's noise-free and it's of any time duration required. So this is as opposed to what's often called numerical or practical identifiability, which is actually the parameter estimation problem when you have real and often noisy data. Um, so why do we care about structural identifiability? Well, structural identifiability is a necessary condition for practical identifiability. And as we'll see shortly, it's just going to be an algebraic condition. So the reason I'm talking about it today is it's going to boil down to just solving a system of polynomial equations. All right, um, so where does it come up? Well, it comes up in biological modeling. So for example, in systems biology, in biochemical reaction networks. But today, I'm going to be talking about what are called viscoelastic mechanical models. Um, so an outline for my talk today is um, I'm first going to give some background on what it means to be a viscoelastic mechanical model. Then I'll talk about the identifiability problem. And finally, I'll talk about some of our results. OK. So first, let's talk about what it means to be elastic. So an elastic material can be represented by a spring. Uh, and a spring obeys Hooke's law, uh, this relationship. Well, actually, Hooke's law divided by the area. But we get this relationship sigma equals e times epsilon where sigma is the stress, epsilon is the strain, and E is our spring constant. So this is typically an unknown parameter. Um, but the idea is, if you knew your stress and you, and you knew your strain at some time instance, you could plug that information into this equation, and you could determine your spring constant. OK. So now let's talk about what it means to be a viscous material. So a viscous material can be represented by what's called a dash pot, or more familiarly by a piston, like in your car. And a dash pot obeys this relationship sigma equals eta times epsilon dot, where epsilon dot is the derivative of the strain, and eta is your dash pot constant. Again, it's typically an unknown parameter. But again, if you knew your stress and you knew your strain rate at some time instance, you could plug that in and determine the dash pot constant. OK, so now let's talk about what it means to be a viscoelastic material. So that means your, your material exhibits both viscous and elastic properties. So the way we represent this is by combining springs and dash pots in series or in parallel. So for example, we could do a simple series extension. We could do a parallel extension. Or we could do something more complicated by continuing to combine in series or in parallel. So we call this a spring dash pot network. All right, so where are these used? Well, one particular application is in cardiovascular modeling. So in our bodies, changing blood pressure causes periodic expansion and contraction of the arterial walls. Uh, in other words, the walls of our arteries. And if you look at the stress-strain curves of the arterial walls, they exhibit uh, hysteresis, which basically means um, instead of just having a nice, simple, linear relationship with, between the stress and the strain, which would be signature of an elastic material, you have a more complicated relationship, which means that it's viscous and elastic. So for this reason, we can use spring dash pot networks to model the biomechanical properties of the arterial walls. OK, so let's say, uh, so let's say we have some spring dash pot network. So the idea is, for each individual uh, spring and dash pot, they have their own corresponding spring and dash pot constant. So for example, in this picture here, we have four springs and four dash pots. So that means we have a total of eight different constants, which means we really have eight different stress-strain relationships. So what we would like to do is find a relationship between the total stress and the total strain. In other words, what we'd really like to do is do some elimination and get a single equation purely in terms of the total stress and the total strain. OK, so the way we're going to do this is using sort of two very fundamental physics rules. 
The first is if you combine in series, the stress is the same on both elements, but the total strain is the sum of the individual strains versus if you combine in parallel, the strain is the same on both elements, but then the total stress is the sum of the individual stresses. Okay, so let's look at an example. Okay, so let's say I decide to take a spring and a dash pot and combine them in series. So this is a, a commonly done, so it has a special name. It's called a Maxwell element. So for our spring and for our dash pot, we have these two stress-strain relationships. And what we would do is use these rules we just mentioned. The stresses are the same, but the total strains, for the total strains that you sum the individual strains. So what we can do is take our two equations, uh, divide by their respective constants, sum them up, and then we can eliminate the individual stresses and strains and get this total stress-strain relationship. So here we can see it's this first order linear uh, differential equation. Okay, so now let's say we decide to combine in parallel. So uh, we take our spring, we take our dash pot, we combine them in parallel. Now the strains are the same, but the stresses are added. So again, we could take our two equations, sum them up, and then we can eliminate the individual stresses and strains using our rules, and again, get a total stress-strain relationship. In this case, again, we get a first-order linear differential equation. Okay, so you can imagine continuing this type of process. So let's say, for example, we take a Voigt and we take a Maxwell, put them in series. This is called a Berger's model. And again, the idea is you can use these rules to eliminate the individual stresses and strains and get a total stress-strain relationship. So in this case, we get this second-order linear differential equation. So as we're seeing, sort of the pattern is we always get these linear differential equations where the coefficients are rational functions in the parameters, in the unknown parameters. Okay. All right. So let's generalize. So first of all, we found that for any configuration of n springs and m dash pots, you can always get a total stress-strain relationship of one of four types. And the types are defined by the differential orders, the highest differential orders and the lowest differential orders in, in sigma and in epsilon. So in the first type, type A, as you can see, we have the highest differential order in epsilon is equal to the highest differential order in sigma. We're calling that n. And likewise, for the lowest differential orders, they're both zero uh, <laughs> differential order for the lowest differential order. OK, and uh, a spring falls into that category. So then for type b, um, the highest differential order in epsilon is one greater than that in sigma. And likewise, for the lowest differential order, it's one greater than that for uh, sigma. And a dash pot falls into that category. Then we have type C. Again, similar relationship. In this case, the highest differential order in epsilon is, again, one greater than the highest differential order in sigma. And then the lowest differential orders are the same. They're both 0. And uh, a, void, a void element follows that pattern. And finally, we have type D, where the highest differential orders are the same, but the lowest differential order in epsilon is one greater than in sigma. And a Maxwell follows that pattern. OK, so the idea is we have this total stress-strain relationship. So now we can go ahead and talk about the identifiability problem. So in the classic identifiability problem setup, the idea is we assume we can recover values of our coefficients of our total stress-strain relationship from enough known input-output data. In other words, in our case, uh, stress and strain data. So the question is, is it possible to recover values of the parameters from these coefficients? So in other words, uh, looking back at our example, this Berger's model, the idea is we're assuming we know values of the four coefficients in red, but the question is, can we determine the individual parameters? In this case, there's four of them, E, M, E, V, eta M, and eta V. OK, so of course, another way of saying this is if we form the mapping from our four parameters to these four coefficients, what we're really asking is, is this mapping one to one? So is my mapping from my four parameters to these four coefficients, is that one to one? Okay, 
So let's uh, formalize this. So we have some total stress strain relationship, and I've just listed one of the types here. Uh, and I should mention that uh, we, when we talk about identifiability, we always want to normalize the equation. So we either have it monic in epsilon or in sigma. And we can form our coefficient map, which is a mapping from our n plus m parameters, because there was n springs and m dash pots, to our coefficients. And by number of coefficients here, I really mean the number of non-monic coefficients. In other words, all the coefficients besides the coefficient 1. So we can form this coefficient mapping. And we define identifiability in the following way. We say our model is globally identifiable if and only if our coefficient map C is 1 to 1, locally identifiable if and only if it's finite to 1, and unidentifiable if and only if it's infinite to 1. And I should mention here an important point is um, we're going to be considering generic identifiability. In other words, um, the identifiability holds everywhere except on a set of measure 0. So even though I may sometimes forget to say that, we're always talking about generic identifiability. All right. OK. So uh, I'll go ahead and state our main result. So we found that a viscoelastic mechanical model ha is locally identifiable if and only if the number of coefficients, in other words, the number of non-monic coefficients, equals the number of parameters. And I'm going to spend uh, basically the rest of the talk giving sort of an outline for, this, uh, for the proof of this theorem. But I want to mention the forward direction is actually not too hard to see. Um, we found that for viscoelastic mechanical models, the number of parameters is always greater than or equal to the number of coefficients. So from this, we can get that a necessary condition for local identifiability is that the number of coefficients equal the number of parameters. So showing that it's a sufficient condition as well is a bit trickier, and that's uh, what I'll spend most of the time um, describing. Uh, so how would we use this result? Well, going back to our three examples of the Voigt and Maxwell and um, Berger's models, uh, you can see all we have to do is just count the number of coefficients and count the number of parameters and see that they're equal. So all three of these models are, in fact, at least locally identifiable. I'll talk about um, they're actually globally identifiable, and I'll talk about that later in the talk. OK, so how are we going to um, prove this result? Well, the idea is let's consider a spring dash pot system M, which is a series connection of two systems, N1 and N2. And I should mention in, in uh, everything I'm uh, going to say, uh, even though I'm going to be talking about the series connection, everything can be analogously applied for a parallel connection. So I'm going to focus on a series connection. All right, so we found that a necessary condition for M to be locally identifiable is that both the systems N1 and N2 are both locally identifiable. And uh, to be more specific, we found that the coefficient maps for these systems, N1 and N2, have to be generically finite to 1 and also on 2. So this will come into, uh, this will be important later on. OK, so what this means then is if we have some system M and we want to determine if it's locally identifiable, uh, we can reduce this problem to just asking the following question. When is the series connection of two locally identifiable models locally identifiable? OK, so before I get into answering that, I want to mention one other result we have. And this result is sort of a combination of our result about the types and our result about identifiability. Uh, so we found that, let's say you have two locally identifiable systems, N1 and N2. And if, let's say, you combine them in series, we found that the resulting model is either identifiable of one of these four types, A, B, C, or D, or it's unidentifiable, which we denote by U. So in other words, uh, this table shows, if, shows us if I take any two systems of, let's say, for example, a type A and a type B, let's say, and I combine them in series, uh, this, the fact that I have a D here means that that resulting model is type D and it's identifiable. And we have a similar table for the parallel case. Okay, so how would we use this result? Well, the idea is 
we can actually uh, determine local identifiability without even calculating the total stress strain relationship. So what this means is if I have some complicated stress, uh, sorry, um, spring dash pot network, uh, since a spring is type A and a dash pot is type B, I can describe it in terms of the series and parallel connections, use my tables, and successively simplify this down to, in this case, a type D. So this model is, in fact, locally identifiable. All right. OK. So um, let's get back to this question of trying to prove our main result. So the way we're going to do this is the following. We're going to generalize the process of combining in series and in parallel using this linear differential operator notation. So let's say I have two spring dash pot networks, N1 and N2, that are both locally identifiable. I'm going to rewrite the stress strain relationships slightly. We'll write them in terms of these linear differential operators, where, for example, we'll write L1 um, having its highest differential order is N1 and its lowest differential order is M1, and similarly for the other uh, operators. And we saw earlier that there's actually restrictions on the highest differential orders and lowest differential orders, but for now, let's just write things in this general form just for simplicity. Okay, so now let's talk about a series connection. So we said when we combine in series, the stresses are the same, but the strains are added. So what we can do, um, if you sort of think of these manipulating these uh, linear differential operators kind of like polynomials, since they're really just like polynomials in DDT, we can multiply the first equation by L3, multiply the second equation by L1, and then sum these two equations, and then we can eliminate the individual stresses and strains, and thus get this total stress-strain relationship. And I should mention, um, so in order to make sure, in order to guarantee that this equation is monic, what we would do for a series connection is uh, we would want L1 and L3 to be monic so that this resulting um, equation is monic, in, since L1 times L3 would then be monic. Okay. So now for a parallel connection, uh, in this case, the strains are the same, but the stresses are added. So in this case, we could multiply the first equation by L4, the second equation by L2, again, sum them up and we get our total stress-strain relationship. And again, to guarantee that it's monic, we would want L2, to be, L2 and L4 to be monic so that the resulting equation is monic. OK. So uh, we had mentioned earlier that there was only specific types of viscoelastic models. And now what we're going to do is rephrase that uh, result in terms of what we're going to call the shape of a linear operator. So we'll define the shape of a linear operator as a pair of numbers, ni and mi, where ni is the highest differential order and mi is the lowest differential order. So we could just rephrase our previous result in terms of shapes. Uh, so for example, type A, the shape of uh, the linear operator in epsilon would be n0, and the linear operator acting on sigma would be n0, et cetera. Okay. So what we're going to do, why are we talking about shapes? Well, the idea is we can totally rephrase our identifiability problem in terms of what we're going to call a shape factorization problem. So again, let's let N1 and N2 be our locally identifiable networks that have these stress-strain relationships. So let's say I take my two networks and I combine them in series. So what does that mean? Well, one way of thinking about that is we're taking our equations for N1 and N2 and mapping them to this new equation, F epsilon equals G sigma, where F is L1 times L3 and G is L1 times L4 plus L2 times L3. All right, so what does this mean in terms of identifiability? Well, what we can think of this as is it's the way to check identifiability is really what we're asking is, is the mapping from our old coefficients to these new coefficients, is that finite to 1? In other words, if you think of your coefficients of your two networks, uh, of, the, of the two stress-strain relationships for N1 and N2 as arbitrary, in other words, they're kind of like your parameters, you're really asking, is that step finite to 1? OK, so um, what we're going to do is because the shapes of L1, L2, L3, and L4 all have they all, um, their shapes are all determined by these specific networks, N1 and N2, we can rephrase the identifiability problem in terms of their shapes. So let me go ahead and define the problem. 
So we say the shape factorization problem for some quadruple of shapes is for a generic, poly for a generic pair of polynomials, f and g, where f is monic and the shape of f and the shape of g are given by these expressions here, the question is, does there exist finitely many quadruples of polynomials, L1, L2, L3, L4, where the shape of Li is Ni, Mi, and L1 and L3 are monic, such that F equals L1 times L3 and G equals L1 times L4 plus L2 times L3. Okay, so let's uh, demonstrate this with an example. So let's say we're combining a type A and a type C in series. So for example, uh, let's just pick a quadruple of this form, 2020 for A and 3020 for C. So let's let F and G be a generic pair of polynomials that are both degree 5 with non-zero constant terms and F is monic. Then our question is, does there exist finitely many polynomials L1, L2, L3, and L4, such that f equals L1 times L3, and g equals L1 times L4 plus L2 times L3. So equivalently, obviously, another way of saying this is, for generic values of our coefficients of f and our coefficients of g, does this system in 11, of 11 equations in 11 unknowns have only finitely many solutions, right? Okay. So let's talk about solving this problem. So the key idea here is that for given shapes, n1, m1, and n3, m3, there are most finitely many ways to factor a monic polynomial into monic factors where L1 has shape n1, m1, and similarly for L3. So once we pick one of these finitely many factorizations, that means we fix L1 and fix L3, then this equation for G is now a linear system in the unknowns L2 and L4. So now that it's a linear system, we just want to know when does this linear system have a unique solution? And we found that it has one solution if and only if the number of coefficients equals the number of parameters. So the way we determined this was um, when you form this linear system and when you look at your matrix, it turns out that a sub-matrix of your matrix is actually the Sylvester matrix of L1 and L3. And since the Sylvester matrix is invertible for generic uh, polynomials, uh, L1 and L3, uh, then we found that our matrix is generically invertible uh, if and only if the, it's a square matrix, and we found that happens precisely when number of coefficients equals number of parameters. All right, so then let's talk about this question of global identifiability. So this is basically the question of when do we have a unique solution to our shape factorization problem. And this happens when f has a unique factorization. Well, when does that happen? That happens precisely when the highest differential order equals the lowest differential order in either L1 or L3. In other words, you just have a single term. And that happens only when you're adding either a spring or a dash pot exactly one at a time. So for example, going back to this uh, model here, we found that it was locally identifiable, but it's also globally identifiable um, because each spring and each dash pot, each time we're adding them, we're adding them precisely one at a time. So what's an example of something that's uh, locally but not globally identifiable? For example, if you took a void, uh, this uh, spring and dash pot in parallel, and then combined it with another void in series, though that would be locally but not globally because you could sort of generically exchange them. Okay, so um, I guess I'll end there. So in summary, we found necessary and sufficient conditions for global and local identifiability. We found these tables, and I just want to very briefly mention everything we talked about today in terms of viscoelastic models can be exactly translated to the electric circuit world with resistors and capacitors. So if for the equations for resistors and capacitors you could get in terms of voltage and current, exactly translates. The problem is though if you add a third element, an inductor, then things get a bit trickier. So that's what we're working on now. All right, uh, that's it, thank you. Yes. Uh, <clears throat>
seem to be uh, assuming that all those circuits are series parallel constructible. Yeah, so that's all, that's the only one we didn't we we didn't do like Kirchhoff loop rules or anything like that. We we only did the simple series and parallel connections. The theorem is for all constructible networks by series. Series and parallel. parallel. Yes. So just a question. I mean, there's a big literature in the electrical engineering side on network realization, passive network realization. I mean, how does this stuff relate to all, to all of that? Uh, so you mean in terms of identifiability? Well, so, so yeah, so I mean, so actually the identifiability problem, interestingly enough, isn't really studied very, very, I mean, it's not actually very, it hadn't been studied very, very much up to this point. So we actually, there wasn't, you know, there there um, wasn't sort of a standard method, so that's why you know we were able to sort of apply these um, this By more you mean unique realization. Somehow, if you can exactly identify the parameters. Well, yeah. So it was about that coefficient map. When we form our total stress strain relationship, about determining if that coefficient map was, you know, generically one to one, finite to one, or inf or infinite to one. But also in engineering, oftentimes you have nonlinear problems. So you, I mean, we only touch the linear version of viscoelastic. Um, so this was sort of an, you know, ideal case. Good question. No. Okay. So then uh, let's stop here, and we conclude.